This tanks have been used against peaceful demonstrators. There's a famous photograph of Tiananmen Square of the young man standing in front and stopping a tank. But the tanks don't always stop. You're naive if you think the government will be nonviolent because you're being nonviolent. The nature of those regimes is that they use violence and extreme repression against innocent people. And don't be surprised at that. You've got to count. But what would they do if you were coming out with a gun? If you had an anti-tank weapon? You think they're going to blow up you and kiss you before that? The nature of those regimes is that they achieve violence, they achieve their position by the threat of violence and maintain their hold on the nation by the infliction of violence. And this is a means of fighting that. You can't fight them by their own weapons. They are but better they equipped. Prevail. They but are they better equipped to fighting with their own weapons than you are. So they're going to win if you do go to violence. They're going to win anyway. The Chinese Communist Party is still in power all these years after Tiananmen Square. The That's Syrian a, government is still in power. But it's still shaky. In t t China, there was no planning, no preparations, no instructions to what people should do, although they behave nonviolently, overwhelmingly. But nonviolent struggle is something that is used when people have no guns. And they don't, or they choose not to fight with guns. If they're wise enough not to fight with the weapons that your enemy is best equipped to use against you, that doesn't work. You have to do something different, something that will be difficult for the regime to cope with, something that will boomerang back on the government that will weaken the government by its very brutalities. What would be your advice to? protesters in Syria now trying to bring down the government of Bashar al-Assad? Maintain nonviolence. Do not organize the mutinying soldiers to use violence against the remaining army. That is suicidal. It is a tool. That becomes a tool. That's, that's what the government would want you to do. And so don't play into their hands by doing what they want you to do. Keep nonviolent so but to get the, you use the mutinying soldiers to persuade the rest of the soldiers also to mutiny, take the army away, and the regime will come tumbling down. But you've got to take the army away, not to fight it by violence. Take it away so that it, you, they issue orders and nothing happens. How do you do that, though, if you have a circumstance, as you do in Syria and in many other places, where the society is split by sect. I mean, in Syria, in Bahrain as well, where the army is of one sect and many of the demonstrators are of another. So you have that division. That a similar d division happened in India. The split between Hindus and Muslims and other religious groups was a very big problem. And Gandhi always emphasized, emphasized that you are not opposed to this other religious or cultural group. You are brothers and sisters together. And you, they must join in, and you hope they will. You welcome them to come and join you. It's a difficult situation. It's not easy. You have to know your situation in depth in planning how you're going to conduct the struggle and how you're going to win over the people who might be siding with the present regime. What should be the role of the outside powers? Well, I generally tend to ignore the outside powers in my analyses. What they do may be a good thing. It's not going to do the job for you. But you have to do that yourself. It, it's, the, it's the old slogan in, of the Irish peasants in, in Parnell back in the 19th century, rely on yourselves alone. It's Gandhi's message. Don't depend on outsiders. And they're not going to come and help you. And if they do, they're coming for their own objectives and their own interests, and they will try to exploit the situation for their purposes, not to help you be really free and in democratic control of your country. Colonel Gaddafi wouldn't have fallen without NATO intervention. Gaddafi might have fallen weeks before if there had been no NATO, U.S. and French intervention. The military defected in the East, but in the West, the military were still killing people, and Gaddafi also employed mercenaries. Doesn't sure. that show the, the limits 
to the kind of non-violent protests that you're talking about? There are problems, but this is a major example of what not to do. That struggle went on then for months, still with the French and U.S. and and into the assistance. Do you think, though, that some of these dictatorial governments are wising up to the kind of strategy you propose and using extreme violence in order to stop it working right at the beginning? Uh, of course they're wising up. They may not only use extreme violence. That, that's a crude tool. They may try to use more sophisticated means of defecting this. Because this knowledge that people have power potential that they're not using yet, but they could use. And they, the people themselves, could, without outside intervention, without violence, could bring down dictatorship. This is a terrifying thought for all dictators, a terrifying thought. And therefore, you expect them to do all kinds of things, including individual assassinations. It simply is one small part of what they will do. One of the things that you've said is that it isn't enough to bring down a dictatorship there also must be a democracy, a better system installed afterwards. Bringing down the dictatorship is only part one. Part two is how you construct a new society, a new democratic system, structurally with elections and multiple parties, but also how you prevent a key group, another key group from coming in and taking control, as the Bolsheviks did in Russia, as the Ayatollahs did in Iran, you, to do that, it's a very important part. We, I have an Einstein Institution and on our website is a booklet that I co-edited, I co-wrote, called The Anti-Coup, How to Prevent the Carrying Out of a Coup d'etat and How to Resist It if, and Defeat It if it happens. To my knowledge, in English, this is the only available handbook of how to do this, and it's being widely ignored by democratic governments who should be pushing it it should be distributed to all parts of the world where they suffer from coup d'etat, and it's not happening so much anymore. One of the things that people say is that these revolutions that we've seen in the Arab world will usher in government by the Islamists. By the? Islamists. Uh -huh. Does that bother you? I don't like governments controlled by any doctrinal group. But you know, the Muslim Brotherhood is who they have in mind. But the Muslim Brotherhood had this same essay in Arabic on their website as required reading from years. That's not a tool you teach the people you want to become ruling over. It shows they had really a recognition that nonviolent means of people power were very important in achieving the kind of society they would like or else it was just expedient as long as they were trying to overthrow the dictator, but the moment they're in power, they do something different. But the very short-range view, if that's the case, because if you tell people you have great power and here's what you can do to control any regime that's trying to boss you around that you don't like, you don't tell them how to do it, because they'll remember. Somebody will remember. Somebody will be distributing that same information in society. So I credit, I, I'm no apologist for authority on the Muslim Brotherhood or any other groups in, in Egypt. But it's, it's a very important that this struggle must continue. One of our important colleagues, Robert Helvey, the former military man, is now writing a, a, another guide as to how to carry out the second stage of the revolution, which is how to install the really a viable and effective and permanent democratic system. Because some people might say that you're giving a recipe for making countries ungovernable. That the moment you don't like something, right, out on the streets. Ungovernable by anyone who wants to boss them around and be a tyrant? Yes. But there's always but divisions in society, in government, in countries. Fortunately, if everybody was all uniform, it would be a tool for dictators to benefit from. If it, conflicts are inevitable. Differences are good. It gives a chance to go and, and meet a, a better society through difficulties that often, but it shows it is possible to do that. Some people say that what you're trying to propose is an imposition of Western or American values, that maybe they don't want democratic societies, maybe some people, some countries want something different. The idea of democracy is a Western 
support is really nonsense. People in none of these other countries that we might normally think of as undeveloped, they often use very democratic and participatory means of determining their policies and organizing their societies. And actually, Western governments have not always been democratic. Look at some of the worst tyranny, tyrannies of the world ever in human history have been in Western countries. So the idea that it's Westerners are always democratic and they're importing and imposing this is utter nonsense. Do you think that the rapid overthrow of governments, for example, in, in Egypt and Tunisia, is making people think it's a lot easier than it really is and that it can be much quicker than it is likely to be? Oh, that's quite possible, yes. That's quite possible. But that's why I emphasize people to learn to understand their society and their current situation very well. And they should realize that, that this may be different than happens next door or in another country. It may be taking a long time. But wars take a long time, you know. The, the military action in Libya took a long time, you know. In Europe, they had the Hundred Years' War, you know. How long did World War II take? You know, it didn't happen in two weeks. There wasn't a victory in two weeks. Be self-confident if you are ready. If you're strong enough, if you recognize you need to keep nonviolent discipline, if you can cast off fear as the people of Egypt and Syria and other countries have done, the people who said, I'm not afraid. This is what happened in India, Jawaharlal Nehru wrote in his autobiography, people cast off fear, they raised their heads, they threw back their shoulders and stood up and said, we're not afraid anymore, we're ready to struggle for getting our political freedom. People all over the world can do that, and it has happened in the Arab world to an amazing degree with great difficulty and great sacrifice, and still problems ahead that they, can, they are now recognized they will be able to tackle. A lot of people who lost their fear are now dead. Yes, of course. And the same what happens in a war. The, the casualty rates in Iraq is just one example. What are the casualty rates in, in Libya? I, well, it happened sup supposedly quickly, but a long, long time. And I've heard from a Reuters report what those casualty rates were immense. I don't remember the, fit the exact number. But the idea that if you go into violence, it will be quick and easy and you won't you know, die is opposite of the truth. You're probably more of you're going to die if you go into violence than if you maintain nonviolent discipline. And it may well take longer, and you may get a, get a regime you don't like after you've done all of that because you went over the violence and played by the enemy's rules. So even with Syria now, in the face of all the tanks, all the machine guns, all the rockets which Assad's forces are firing into the neighborhoods which are under opposition control. You would say to them, you put your hands up and you don't fight back. You fight back, but with different weapons. You don't fight with the weapons they have chosen. But those are the weapons of tyranny. The weapons of, of freedom are the people of nonviolent discipline, the power to disobey, the power to go on political or economic strike, to defy the regime, in sp the Syrians have amazingly held great discipline and great courage, and that's what's required to bring a, a democratic Syria, not to just a change in government, not by a coup d'etat, not by a foreign engineer's help in quotation marks, but by fighting by your own nonviolent people power weapons.